to Weekend Edition. In November of last year, the Judiciary of Guam launched a new therapeutic court. The Driving While Under the Influence Court project has seen significant success in just the last seven months alone. In the past, the Attorney General's office had difficulty prosecuting the hundreds of DUI and DWI cases each year, but stakeholders have band together to help curb impaired driving and hold offenders accountable for their actions. Joining me in studio are Superior Court Judge Elizabeth Barrett Anderson, Attorney General Leonardo Rapatis, and Captain Paul Suba from the Guam Police Department's Highway Patrol Division. Thank you all so much for coming in. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Uh, Judge, let's start with you. Let's talk a little bit about the DWI court and how it differs from the traditional court. The DWI court is different only in the sense that uh, all DWI or DUI cases are funneled into a single judge. Uh, in the last uh, six months, we've had over 713 cases filed. Uh, congratulations to the Attorney General's Office for the, taking care of the backlog. So it's funneled all into one judge. I have an assigned prosecutor, a senior prosecutor from the Attorney General's Office. I have assigned public defenders. So when defendants are arrested, booked, and confined, they come in front of the court system within 24 hours and in front of me within uh, about 30 days and the process begins. Wow. The process of the criminal justice system, getting them to um, either resolve their case by pleading guilty or going to trial, but it, it's this small little funnel and it all comes down to the DWI court, which is a treatment court. Primarily DWI court is a treatment court, a problem solving court, and the treatment that we're dealing with in DWI court is the alcoholism and the addiction to alcoholism. 700 plus, that's seems significant. In six months, it's very significant. 53 are felonies, 660 are misdemeanors. 70% of those uh, 700 plus cases are first offender drunk drivers. So uh, it's people like you and me, uh, the average Joe mm -hmm. uh, who finds themselves uh, in, in, a, in a, an unfortunate situation because of good law enforcement, I think. Well, and speaking of law enforcement, Captain mm -hmm. Suba, I know that you, this has been one thing, one of your major missions yes. um, since you've been with the police department mm -hmm. for a number of years is really trying to ensure that motorists aren't out there impaired driving on the mm -hmm. roads. Um, tell us what happens to someone when you're arrested for DUI, mm -hmm. um, what process your officers put them through, especially in light of the automatic confinement policy that's now in place. Right. Um, it's no different than what we've done in the past, but what has really um, accelerated the process is the culmination of Blue Fire, the new laws that have been implemented. So to answer your question, uh, the officer will first observe a traffic violation. Mm -hmm. And the key here is that these uh, individuals will drive when they're impaired erratically or too slow or too fast, uh, violate traffic uh, signal lights or any combination of those. Uh, they can also be apprehended during a DUI checkpoint where every other car or every fourth car is flagged in and the uh, process then begins after a traffic stop or the DUI checkpoint where the officer first notices either uh, the person's speech, glassy-eyed uh, look, uh, other impairments, uh, uh, then they uh, incorporate uh, an FST, field sobriety test and uh, that could be one, two, three, a multiple, depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. So questions are asked, interaction is, is conducted between the officer and the driver. Uh, when the officer determines that there is impairment uh, due to intoxication by drugs or alcohol, um, then they are arrested and uh, brought before uh, the court. And also a report obviously is generated and sent to the AGs. The AGs office will then take a look and see if there are other mitigating factors, other uh, situations. If not, if it's a first-time offense, like uh, the judge had stated, then the individual will usually normally uh, be released, but with conditions. And I like the idea that the court looks at it as a uh, problem-solving situation. So at that end, we respect the fact that the individual is not just locked up. They're given a chance to be released uh, if it's their first time look at programs and, and uh, things that they can uh, get into uh, on their own mm -hmm. and unless then determined by the court. Okay. And so it's, it protects people from uh, repeat offense. And then there's a third arm to this and, and that would be the Attorney General's office. And I know uh, just from stories that we've done over the years is that a lot of time DWI cases and DUI cases just kind of fell through the cracks just because right. uh, there wasn't enough uh, uh, 
staff for you all to be able to prosecute these cases. That has obviously since changed. That, that, has, has, that has changed. In the past, it frustrated me because what we did, what we had were multiple, multi offenses by one person in different courts. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's the one thing that, that is occurring now is there's a focused look at each defendant in one court. So the judge will, will hear a name and automatically, and they'll know. Mm -hmm. know who that person is. The prosecutor, the one, the experienced prosecutor will do the same thing and everything within the office internally, procedurally, is funneled to the prosecutor and the paralegals who work those cases. So they'll know. And the, the big thing is that the case gets charged on the front end right away, which is eliminating, which is what helped eliminate the backlog. Right now, we don't have a, a backlog. You don't have a backlog. <laughs> so now that was one thing that, that I set out to do at the beginning of my term is got to work on this, and then now I can start working on other cases. But, but we're there. It's not over yet. We're still mm -hmm. continuing to do it. Uh, the program seems to be working really well. And I, and I think the, the benefit of that is that the police officers, they, they see something happening with this person mm -hmm. they're arrested. So, so they, you know, they're, um, they really want to, you know, go and get there, go out there and, and, and uh, make the arrest, the good arrest. And they, they know that something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the public, they see the arrest. They see uh, some consequence to the actions of either their, act, their, their actions or the actions of someone else. And they see that there, are, there is something deterrent. happening and it's consistent. Absolutely, definitely a good deterrent when you have the police officers out there, automatic confinement, and then you know that, hey, my case isn't just gonna fall through the cracks. Right. You're gonna get right. prosecuted. And then they, they show up <laughs> and appear before you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you mentioned 70% are first time offenders, mm -hmm. but then you, you have those cases of recidivism. Yes, we do. And, yes. and so what happens in instances where you, you look at their file and you say, well, you've been before me twice already. Well, the uh, sentencing and punishing is, uh, is tougher, and the monitoring is tougher, and the drug testing is tougher. And where you have a felony case in front of me, I'm a hard judge. Uh, first offenders, uh, it's usually just two days in jail, uh, uh, one year confinement suspended, a thousand dollar fine, treatment, your license is suspended for a period of time. But the second offender and the felony offender they know my face. They know that I'm taking this very seriously. I tell everyone in my courtroom, this is a treatment court. Mm -hmm. What don't you get about going to your treatment? And that wasn't necessarily done when the cases were among all the various judges. And defendants could play the prosecutor and the judges depending on, oh, they'd be in this judge's courtroom and then that one. And, and there wasn't a consistency. So um, they see my face and, and uh, Sometimes uh, this is a nice face, and sometimes it's not a nice face if they're uh, violating their probation or not doing what they're supposed to do in treatment. But the other aspect of that, too, is I'm sure that you see success stories. You know, you see those first-time offenders, those yes. people that, you know, it was, it was a bad choice for me to get behind the wheel, um, and I've learned my lesson, I've gone through the treatment that I need to, and you probably will never see them again. And defendants who do their uh, probation and do what their treatment very quickly, they are rewarded. I say, do you want to close your case now because you have done everything? Go forth and don't uh, DUI again or DWI again. Absolutely, there's a good balance. The difficult the, uh, portion is the 10% that are the real alcoholics. Uh, they're usually 35 and above, uh, and it's trying to get them into a really serious treatment program that we don't have yet on Guam. Okay, mm -hmm. and one last thing for you, Cap, is just to talk a little bit about GPD and your continued efforts as mm -hmm. we go into um, this 4th of July weekend right. now, and then we have liberation coming up, and of course with the holidays, uh, we're going to see more of your guys out there. I know there is a shortage of manpower, mm -hmm. but you all are still making a great effort to really get out there, show people that, hey, we mm -hmm. are out there. Whether or not you see those sobriety checkpoints from a yeah. mile away, you, you mm -hmm. be careful because the officers are out there mm -hmm. looking for you. You're right, and uh, not only this holiday, which is going to be a big event for the entire community and our uh, guests, the men and women of the Guam Police Department and other law enforcement agencies have been uh, committed. They've made a statement of commitment. And I see and hear their hard work every day. And they are looking at this Liberation Day and Fourth of July. We're communicating that through media such as this, mm -hmm. and we appreciate it. Because we can't even calculate all the lives that have been saved because of the passion of these men and women, because of the, the terrible 
uh, tragedies that they've experienced seen and had to investigate and, and deal with families. So you're right, they're going to do it, shortage or not. We're finding ways uh, using even CAPE and CVPR, the, the police volunteers and the volunteer community service people. They, they come out and help us on checkpoints, mm -hmm. whether it's logistics or other measures. And so my, my one comment, though, to a lot of the viewers and listeners is maybe you're not the person driving drunk because you were smart. You got a designated driver. Or maybe you're just out there driving to and from your daily business or during these holidays. Drive the speed limit or as close as you can to it so that you can react to possibly a drunk driver that crosses that uh, median. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we'll, we'll see a lot safer community. And I thank the ones that have been doing that. Okay, any last words from any of you before we close out? Well, I'm an advocate of designated drivers. I think it works and in a uh, society where we love to party, we, we love to um, um, drink, uh, I think designated driving is the way to go. When you plan a party on Guam, you're planning the canopies, the invitations, and the food. Plan a designated driver for the holidays, uh, whether it's the July 21st holidays or any time you have a, an event. Plan your designated driver as part of your preparation. Anything else from you, Attorney General? Same thing. I, I echo those sentiments. And uh, there are many things party planners can do. And Nets have a, I, I talked to, to the judge about this earlier, about having a key master someone at the door to collect all the keys and then that person needs to be strong and decide whether or not I don't think you should be driving and you know kids who are out there you know when that favorite uncle of yours asks you for that can of beer you've got to be strong too and you've got to say no uncle I, I can't do that um, you know it, it, it's just things that there has to be a sea change in, in how we do things in you know, in our partying lives I mean you can you can have a good time you know, have your, your drinks, but still be safe. And Absolutely. designated drivers, key masters, people being strong, kids being strong, and, and kids edu you know, educating, well, you know, they're educating the adults, basically. Mm -hmm. If we do all of that, then I think we'd have, we'll have a much safer holiday. Absolutely, well thank you all so much for coming in, I appreciate it. Thanks for having us. And remember, if you plan on partying this holiday weekend or any time, have a designated driver because doing otherwise could land you a trip to jail and, of course, a visit to the DWI court to see Judge Barrett Anderson herself. Stay with us. Weekend Edition returns right after this. Click on KUAM.com, bringing the world at home close to you. No matter where you are, nationally recognized for excellence by the Radio and Television News Directors Association.